as a meter dose. Comes out, you know exactly the dose that you're getting, sprays on, the film coats over the active, it absorbs into your skin, your skin now becomes the delivery system. And we can program it so that it become a 12 hour duration. In this case, because we're doing what's called a 505B2 pathway, that's a pathway that the FDA allows us to use when we improve or we change a delivery system. We go that pathway because it also allows us, once we complete all of the clinical studies, it allows us to file and get a 10-month review. Uh, we like to expedite that review, but 10 months is still a good review time. So, so the reason why I talk about this particular topical administration is because it stays on, stays on for the full dose. You know what you're getting. It stays on for the full 12 hours because it's a spray film. So there's no, there's no coming off, peeling off. You don't have a concern with wearing. You can wear your normal clothes that you normally wear. It won't rub off. Um, so, so I think our therapy is a great enhancement to the current topicals that are out there. You know, we had hydrogels, we had pressure sensitive adhesives, we had matrix patches, and now we have the next evolution of that with our spray film technology. So now the spray film technology, tell me about this. You spray it on the skin and does um, something go, a film go over it to make sure that it stays on? Yeah, that's correct. So we, what we, when we spray it on, it goes on wet, of course. But unlike, you know, we have the gels that are out there or the creams that are out there, it doesn't take long to dry. We're talking about under two minutes for drying. Probably a minute and a half is what we have in most of the formulations. So once it goes on a minute and a half to dry, it's going to last the full 12 hours. And so in, in the case of the inset, if you need to apply it again to that area, 12 hours later, you can apply it again to that particular area of the body. So this is a great time to take a break. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Dr. Janine Cookerard, and we will continue talking to Anthony Mack about non-opioid development after this short break. Antifreeze, floor wax, or house paint? You're kidding, right? They're toxic. It's something that humans should not be eating or drinking. The truth is, 62% of medications purchased online are fake, and many contain these harmful ingredients. So these are just frauds. Pretty dirty trick to play on somebody. You're taking their money and giving them this. I want to take medication to stay healthy, not make me a lot sicker. And what do you think about this item? That is a big bowl of nothing. Many rogue sites sell prescriptions with little to no medication at all. The good news is you can find legitimate online pharmacies by looking for dot .pharmacy in a website's address. So if I see dot .pharmacy, it's legit. Visit safe.pharmacy to learn how you and your loved ones can be certain the medications you buy online are safe. A public service from the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy. 90.3 Welcome back to Your Family's Health on the voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Dr. Janine Cookerard, and today our guest is Anthony Mack. Welcome back, Anthony. Hello. Thank you. So we, this very interesting, um, this new way of thinking about non-opioid um, medications to alleviate pain in the population. So when we talk about these non-opioids in this particular um, medication that you're talking about or delivery method, would you, would you say that it's a delivery method? Uh, yeah, it's a delivery method. We're using the same products, you know, that the FDA is used to. We're not using any solvents or polymers that are unique to the FDA. Um, we call it GRASS, where these products are all products that have been approved by the FDA, all of the excipients. So uh, it's just a, another way of delivering the technology. Um, as I said you know, earlier, it's, it's, it's the evolution of the topical and transdermal products. We've always had creams. We've always had patches. We even have foams. Uh, this spray film technology, with its ability to dial up and dial down on the the length of the time that the product works and the fact that it gives the film and a meter dosing is the thing that's unique. 
So what do you anticipate as being um, the biggest challenge in um, convincing the healthcare providers about this new innovation with regard to uh, non-opioid development with delivery? I think the I think you know based off of our market research and based off of some of our KOLs and some of the folks on our scientific advisory board, they understand that you know these creams, these foams, and technologies like that work. I think the thing that we're going to have to educate them on is the meter dosing. I think that's going to be the thing that's going to be different. Um, the fact that this is a meter dose, I think, is the thing that they can be confident with now when they do this. They don't have to worry about measuring patients, and they don't have to worry about measuring. You know how much they put on their fingers. They don't have to worry about washing their hands afterwards. Uh, once they spray it on, that's it. They don't have to worry about drying time. They don't have to worry about applying it four or five times in a day. Uh, these are the things that we'll have to educate the physician on because what they've seen in the past is you know they got to wash your hands. You know you have to put it on four or five times a day. Uh, here you can put it on if you put it on at eight o'clock. The next time you can put it on is at eight o'clock. You know in the evening. So uh, it'll it'll be ease of dosing, but there will be some level of education that we'd have to make sure that the physicians understand as far as the meter dosing. So tell me, Tony, with regard to this topical spray, are we concerned at all about, you know, is it a dial that we're dialing a particular dosage and then spraying? Um, it, does it look like a spray bottle? How does it vision? Um, just give me a picture. So, so if you can if you can picture an inhaler, okay. there's a metal canister that is in the inhaler. Um, it's probably about the length of a 50 cent piece and it's probably as thick as, you know, two pencils put together. Think of a little bit longer than that, that metal canister. Canister, um, and, and it would probably be something that we would design around it. So it would look nicer than a metal canister, very much like the inhalers. Uh, and when you hit the button, that meter dose, it, you hit it one time, you press it all the way down, and that's all that comes out. That's the only thing that comes out, mm-hmm. very similar to your normal inhaler that you would have for asthma or COPD. And is this being used now, this delivery? Is it being used? It is, it is currently um, in another, what we call phase 2A study with another product called uh, terbenafine, which is a antifungal for, for yeah. um, athlete's foot. And um, it's, uh, it compared itself to a product called Lamisil, mm-hmm. which is promoted by Novartis in the past. And uh, during that head-to-head study, and you can, you can look at that head-to-head study, um, they, when they compared it to Lamisil, which takes seven weeks, which takes, I'm sorry, seven days um, to kill the fungus, uh, the spray film technology did it in one day. Mm-hmm. One application, top of the toes, bottom of the toes. Seven days later, they assessed it. It treated the um, the, uh, the the toe. The, I'm sorry, the fungus mm-hmm. as good, and in some cases, better than the uh, Lamisil by Novartis. So um, the technology definitely works, uh, and um, it definitely at least um, can penetrate the skin. Uh, we know we've done flux studies where we've also compared how our product flux next to products that are currently on the market in patch formulation, and that is the, um, the diclofenac patch. Mm-hmm. It's a hydrogel patch. Mm-hmm. So we've compared it to that particular product, and our, our what we call flux is what we use is we use um, fresh skin, a little, uh, in some cases, uh, from, you know, from, from patients who have donated their skin via, they had some type of surgery, abdominal surgery, and we measure what, how, how much it can go through the skin, how fast it goes through the skin, and so we compare them during those flux studies, we see that our product has better penetration through the skin in a spray film formulation than it does in a topical patch formulation. Mm. Those studies sound interesting. I got to take a look at those. Uh, that's very interesting. I and I hear from you, Tony, that your concern is with the opioid epidemic that we are in this country and around the world globally. Uh, we're seeing more and more of an opioid epidemic with regard to every. I think every age group we're seeing it. What are your concerns there? Yeah, I, I think you know my concern there is that there are patients that legitimately need these pain 
pain medications. And I think that sometimes what we think about is we don't think about those patients. Um, there are going to be people that are going to be you know, put on opioids, of course, that are going to end up abusing those opioids. I think that's where we need to find out, you know, are, are, are the physicians that are prescribing these medications, do they really know how to handle the chronic pain patients? Do they really know the signs and symptoms of a patient becoming addicted to these pain medications versus a patient's pain progressing? Mm-hmm. So I think that, you know, I think that that kind of level of education needs to be discussed. Do we take these patients and do we bring them to physicians who have been trained in the case, you know, where, these, where they've gone and done fellowships in pain management? Because I, I believe I just read recently in in the um, in anesthesiology news or pain medicine news where you know a lot of the physicians or clinicians that go through med school you know forty four percent of them don't feel as though they were properly trained on how to treat the chronic pain patient. Mm-hmm. So this is not something that happens in a rotation in you know in in physici- with physicians. It's just they have so many other things that they have to do in order to get through med school. You know, this is probably not top of, top of mind when, when they're going through their rotations. Mm-hmm. So the, a lot of them have to do fellowships in pain management. Maybe we start steering patients that are in chronic pain to those patients, I mean, to those particular physicians. And, 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 and once they get on there, when they have to be reassessed, not that the primary care physician can't write the scripts, but they get reassessed by that particular doctor. I, I think there's, there's, there's things that we can do, in other words, to make sure that we... Um, um, don't prescribe the patients that shouldn't be prescribed to. We have we, we make sure we read those signs and physicians are familiar with them. And we also make sure that we include real professionals, professionals that know how to treat chronic pain and know the signs and symptoms of abuse. There's enough physicians out there. Uh, a lot of them are anesthesiologists, but a lot of them, you know, you go to a pain week and you can find a you know, you can find thousands of them there that have done fellowships in pain management. So I I know we're running out of time, but this is so, so interesting. Uh, uh, For the listening audience who may be addicted to opioids, can you give us one or two things that they can do or a resource that they can go to? I think immediately you go to your doctor. You, you go to your doctor and you tell that physician or that clinician or you tell that nurse what you believe is going on with you. Um, you know, you tell them, listen, I've been on this medication. I've been on it for a long time. I, I've, I've tried to get off of it. I can't. I cannot get off this medication. I'm starting to drug seek. I'm starting to have behaviors that make me want to go and seek me. Tell them everything that they need to know because they can then guide you and help treat you and get you into the right hands. Um, you know, sometimes in the case you've had a post-op situation, uh, I tell you, if, if before you come off of that medication, very similar when you're on prednisone. People know what prednisone is. They don't just take you off the medication with prednisone. You may have to be titrated down. Down. So if you're on, you know, a high dose of an opioid, you're taking two to three every four to six hours, before you come down, talk to the nurse and the physician about how you can titrate yourself down so you don't go through withdrawal symptoms. I think those are the things that I would like your audience to know. Thank you very much, Tony. It has been a pleasure talking to you. And is there any way that we can contact you or the audience can reach out to your website or anything? Yes, we have our website up. It's uh, www.verpax, V-I-R-P-A-X, pharma, P-H-A-R-M-A, dot com. Thank you again, Tony Mack, for this discussion about non-opioid development. And thank you, the listening audience, for tuning in to Your Family's Health at 90.3 WHPC. This is Dr. Janine Cook, and we will see you next time.